Soldier's Heart by Alex 51324. Chapter 7. September 1915. 14th of September 1915. Dear Anna, the big battle that has been in all the papers is some distance up the line from us. However, there is some fighting in our sector, and we are busier than usual. I will write more when things let up a bit. Thomas. Bloody hell! Thomas said, lifting his head and swiping mud out of his eyes not very effectively, since his hands were filthier than his face. That one was a bit close. Corporal Jessup agreed. It had been close enough that the shower of dirt that sprayed upward when it landed had come down on them. Is the bloke still alive? Thomas asked. It was too dark to really see, except when a shell struck near enough to light the place up for a moment. Yes, up wormed his way over to the stretcher that they'd put down quickly. Dropped when they hit the dirt and checked its occupant's pulse. Ah, better get on. They hoisted the stretcher and trudged on, zigzagging their way through the narrow communication trenches. At least they were heading the right way, toward the rear. Several times they had to back up or duck into a dugout to get out of the way of parties going the opposite direction. Reinforcements, ration carriers, ammunition carriers, all sorts. And other stretcher bearers. The sight of them reminded Thomas that they'd only be going in the right direction until they got to the collecting post. Once they'd handed over this casualty, they'd go back up for another one. You did get a bit of a breather, though, at the collecting post if you were lucky, and this time they were. After they turned their stretcher case over to the jammy bastards who were working on the motor ambulance, which could only go as far forward as there were roads to take it. Yesup searched out a corner out of the wind and lit a cigarette. You're holding up, Yesup asked. Thomas knew that Yesup had been partnered with him to keep an eye on him. Everyone who hadn't been here for the spring pushes had been sent out with one of the corporals. So Thomas was a little self-conscious as he nodded, lighting a cigarette of his own. If it was like this here, he couldn't imagine what it was like up at the big show. But he was holding up. There wasn't actually another choice. We'll manage, he said. We're starting to get on top of them, Yesup said. He didn't mean the Germans, of course. None of them had any idea how the actual fighting was going. He meant that the number of stretcher cases waiting for them at the front line was going down, meaning that they were carrying them back more quickly than new ones were being brought in from no man's land. Good, he said, and smoked some more. Both of them smoked their cigarettes down to the point where they were burning their fingers, but finally they couldn't put it off any longer. They grabbed an empty stretcher and started forward. After two or three more journeys to the front line and back, the terror of being blown to smithereens had resolved into a sort of steady thrum, as much a part of the background as the thunder of the guns, and Thomas found himself more absorbed by the sheer back-breaking labor of it. A man was not a light burden to carry by anyone's reckoning, and when you were lugging it through a muddy, winding ditch in the pitch dark, your feet sliding up from under you every second step, you soon felt it in your shoulders, your back, your thighs. He found himself arriving at the regimental aid post, already out of breath from carrying the empty stretcher. Someone was going round handing out rum rations to order these and wounded alike, and Yesup snagged two mugs, handing one to Thomas and downing his own, almost in the same motion. Thomas hesitated over it. Strong drink sometimes made him sleepy, which was the last thing he needed now. You weren't Methodist, are you? Yesup asked. Thomas shook his head and took a sip of the rum. It burned on the way down even worse than the paint stripper he used to keep in his room at Downton. Yesup clapped him on the shoulder. Take a breather, lad, he said. I should have a look at the walking wounded. He was probably, Thomas thought, supposed to insist that he was fine and could go with Yesup to check the walking wounded. He'd been paired up with an experienced man so that he could learn from him, but he couldn't make himself do it. Instead, he said, You sure? Yesup nodded, shoved his empty mug at Thomas, and left, so Thomas found the nearest out-of-the-way spot and fell over into it, just managing to keep his rum ration upright as he did. He sat slumped for a moment, just breathing, then pulled himself together and lit a cigarette. He was sitting with his elbows on his knees, smoking and dreading the walk back to the collecting post, when someone said, Thomas? His weary mind registered officer before anything else, and he was halfway to his feet before he realized it was Mr. Matthew, Lieutenant Crawley, looking down at him. 
which was even worse, really. Miss Hughes asked every time she wrote if he'd seen Mr. Matthew, and now here he was, and Thomas was sitting on his arse drinking. So, he said, wondering if he really had to drop his cigarette and his rum. As you were, said Lieutenant Crawley quickly. It is you, he went on, leaning against the trench wall in a deliberately casual attitude, which Thomas decided was meant to signal that he was not required to stop smoking, though he did carefully set down his mug and couldn't help thinking about how Carson would react if he got wind that Thomas had spoken to Mr. Matthew with a cigarette in his hand. Cousin Robert mentioned you were supposed to be around here somewhere. 47th Ambulance, sir, he said. Our corporal's just sorting out which casualty we take back next. He hoped that that would convey that he had not been sitting here all night and was, in fact, quite busy. Lieutenant Crawley nodded. I'm on my way to check on my wounded men. Walking wounded are that way, I think. He indicated the direction Yesup had gone. Yes, sir. Must be off, then. Good luck. Thomas was just getting settled back down again when there was a commotion from the other direction. You wouldn't think anyone would take much notice of men shouting, what with all the shell fire and groans of pain and so on, but voices raised in anger were not really something you got much of in a war, and everyone who was fit to do so craned their necks to see what was going on. Soon Dawlish, another man from the 47th, came trotting up. Have you seen Sarge? Which, either of them? Dollar said. Thomas shook his head. Corporal Gessop's gone to look at the walking wounded, he suggested. I love to do, Dollish decided, setting off that way. After a brief moment, Thomas decided he had better go too. The rum had bucked him up a bit, giving him a second wind, so he was no longer quite so keen to hang about within range of the guns if it meant sitting down, and if Yesup got caught up in whatever Dollish needed an NCO for, there was no telling how long it would be before he came looking for Thomas. He caught up to Dollish about the same time that Dollish found Yesup, who was squinting at an abdominal wound. Corporal, Dollish said urgently. Yesup looked up at him. It's Lum, he said. He's hit. Bloody hell. Lamb, Private Lamble, was one of theirs. One of the ones from Thomas's training group, in fact. If Thomas remembered right, he'd had the bad luck to get paired with Diggs for the night's work. Yesup said, Stretch your face. Dollish hesitated. Don't know, Gold. He went up and over with one of this lot to pick one up. Into no man's land, he meant, with one of the men from the regiment. He went on. There was a sharp little shell, and I think he's still alive, but... He stopped. But, asked Jessup. Dollish blurted out. But things won't go get him. Thomas had seen it coming a moment before Dollish said it. That fucking door, sir! Dollish glanced back at Thomas. That's what I wanted, a sergeant! Jessup nodded. Let's go. The three of them set out with Dollish in the lead, taking a communication trench to the first line trench, the front of the front. Keep your heads down, Yesup reminded them just before they entered the first line. Battle, that means even if you see an officer. If he told them back at Downton that he, Thomas Barrow, had a reputation for punctiliousness when it came to the military courtesies, they'd never believe him. Of course, it helped that military courtesies grew more and more abbreviated the closer you got to the front. Otherwise, he'd not have dared address Mr. Matthew or Lieutenant Crawley with a cigarette in his hand. In the first line, it was too loud for much talking. In addition to the ever-present shelling and the odd burst of machine gun fire from across no man's land, there was the rifle fire from their own. The lucky bastards who weren't tapped to go trench raiding that night instead got to stand on the fire step and peer over the edge to shoot anything that moved and didn't look like it was wearing a British uniform. The luckiest bastards of all got to stand behind them and hand them ammunition. Thomas and the others pushed their way through, dollish in the lead, until they got to where Diggs was huddled in a dugout. There were three or four wounded in there, and Diggs might have been quite legitimately tending them, but he wasn't. It was a bit quieter in there, and Yesup said, his voice low and dangerous, Where is he? Diggs extended his hand in the direction of the fire step. Yeah, said Dollish, grabbing the trench periscope. I'll show you. Thomas trailed after them, not really wanting to be alone with Diggs. That kind of thing was contagious, they said. Cowardice. 
While Dalish and Yesup were looking through the periscope, another man from the 47th turned up, Jenkins or something like that. He must have been Dalish's stretcher partner because Yesup said something to them, pointing at the wounded in Diggs' dugout. They grabbed one and started back for the communication trench. Yesup got back up on the fire step and looked through the periscope again. When he got down, he motioned for Thomas to join him in the dugout. Is he still alive? Thomas asked. He almost hoped he wasn't. If he was dead, no one had to go out and get him. Thanks, so. Yesup said with a nod. Moving a bit. The other two are goners, though. That would be the patient and the man who'd been carrying the other end of the stretcher. Turning toward Biggs, he drew himself up as much as the low ceiling of the dugout would allow and said, On your feet! You can't, said Diggs. You're corporal, same as me. I am, said Yesup, and I'm going out there to get the new lad you were supposed to be looking after. I won't, said Diggs, shaking his head. I won't, and you can't like me. Diggs, Yesup said, his voice terribly kind. If you don't, I'm going to have to make a report. You get up off your arse now and all right. You had a bit of a funny turn. Happens to enough of us. But as you get off and got on with it, I won't even ask why you weren't out there with Lamb in the first place. Bloke from the regiment wanted to go, said Diggs. It worries me. I'm not asking. Yes, I repeated. No, said Diggs, shaking his head. I'm not going, and that's final. Yes, I drew in a deep breath. You're absolutely fucking sure about that, Diggs. Because we are in the face of the enemy here. Cowardice in the face of the enemy was a court-martial offense with a punishment going all the way up to execution. Thomas wasn't sure whether it made a difference that Yesup wasn't his superior and couldn't technically give him an order. Not when it was Diggs' plain duty to go, whether anyone told him to or not. I won't, Diggs repeated. Shaking his head, Yesup turned away from him and toward Thomas. I really hate to ask, son, he said, but let's just get it over with, Thomas said. Good man, Yesup said, brushing the dirt off Thomas's Red Cross armband. We stay low, we grab him, we haul our back. Thomas nodded, feeling sick. Before they went over the top, Yesup had him get up on the fire step and looked through the periscope at where Lamble was. You see that shell hole next to him? Yesup asked into his ear. Thomas nodded. You hear rifle or machine gun fire jump in that and stay there till it stops. Thomas nodded again. And keep behind me. Yesup started up the trench ladder. Thomas held his breath when his head went over the parapet, but there was no answering gunfire, and soon he was on his belly on the ground outside the trench, motioning for Thomas to hand the stretcher up and then to come up after him. Thomas did. Once he was up, they picked up the stretcher and began a crouched-over run to Lamble's position. They reached it without incident, unless you counted a shell hitting near enough to make Thomas wish he'd gone to the lavatory before they started. Yesup took a quick look at the other two, who were basically shredded, and then they rolled Lamble unceremoniously onto the stretcher and started back. They were ten yards or so from the parapet when Jessup shouted, Dum! They hit the dirt just in time for a bullet to pass overhead, followed by two more. Thomas's breathing was loud in his ears and quite suddenly, really with no warning at all, he found himself vomiting. They'd been working half the night with nothing to eat, so all he brought up was bile and rum. It tasted even worse than it had on the way down. He didn't have much time to reflect on this development because Yesup signaled to him, then got up into an even lower crouch than before, picking up his end of the stretcher. Thomas grabbed his and they scuttled trench ward, essentially throwing Lamble and then themselves over the parapet. Thomas lay on the duckboards for a moment, contemplating the fact that he'd apparently survived his first experience of direct enemy fire. Then there was a great deal of shouting, and he found himself being hauled to his feet and back into the dugout. He was only vaguely aware that the shouting was congratulatory in nature and being delivered by members of the regiment, some of whom were also getting Lamble sorted out and bringing him into the dugout, too. Yesup was getting dressings out of his bag and leaning over Lamble. Thomas knew he ought to be helping him, but his feet went out from under him. He thought about a calming cigarette, but his hands were shaking too badly to unbutton the pocket he kept them in. Yesup glanced over at him. That's all right, lad, he said. Come, he heard himself saying. I think I'm having one of those funny turns you mentioned. Plenty of people had them, Yesup had said, so it was probably all right. You think, Yesup said with a snort. What put a good time for it, I'd say that. Thanks! Diggs crept over to him like a dog, expecting a beating. 
Yesup gestured toward the first egg bag strapped to his chest, and Diggs gave it to him sharpish. Hold that! Yesup said, pressing Diggs' hand onto a dressing he'd applied somewhere on Lamble's midsection. From Diggs' bag, he took out a glass half-pint bottle, which he uncorked, then leaned over Lamble and handed to Thomas. Got that! All right! It wasn't any part of their kit that Thomas recognized, and Thomas looked dumbly at it, wondering what he was meant to be doing with it, until Yesup said, Drink that up now! Settle your nerves. Oh, Thomas did as instructed, finding that it was whiskey, and fairly decent whiskey at that. Diggs had drunk most of it himself, and by the time Thomas had polished off the rest, in two swigs, he did feel a bit steadier. What do you want me to do now, Cole? Smoke a bloody cigarette. Yesup answered and shouted at Diggs for more dressings. Thomas wasn't sure if he was being sarcastic or not, but when no real orders followed, he slowly unbuttoned the packet where his cigarettes were. By concentrating very carefully on what he was doing, he was able to get one out and light it, only dropping the lighter once. Mr. Matthew, seeing him sitting and drinking, didn't seem so bad anymore. At least he wasn't seeing him sitting, drinking, and panicking! When he got about halfway through his cigarette, Jessup growled, Watch him! at Diggs and came over to sit against the wall with Thomas. All right, then. Thomas nodded. We'll have us a bit of a breather, then take Lamb back he said, lighting a cigarette of his own. Thomas nodded again. Is he? Cup wound, answered Yesup. It's bad. Oh, we'll take him all the way back, Yesup went on. Sooner he gets into theater, the better. Sorry, Thomas said. They'd be getting him back a bit sooner if Thomas wasn't having a funny turn. No, that's all right, Yesup said. The held it together till we got the job done, that's the main thing. Tain't bad at all for your first go-round. Not bad at all. Thomas squinted at him. Are you from Yorkshire? He wasn't talking quite broad enough to be taking the piss. Thought what? Yesup answered. Not for a long time, though, he added, his accent sliding back toward the nondescript one Thomas was used to hearing from him, the one most of the regular army blogs had. Sheffield, he said. I thought I heard a bit of the old ground, Yesup said. Well, you're not talking like you just stepped out of a bloody public school. I was in service, Thomas explained, and I worked in London for a while. He wondered later if Yesup had put on the accent on purpose. It was all right if he had, Thomas decided, because coming from an honest-to-God Yorkshireman, not bought at all, and got the job done, was very nearly the equivalent of a distinguished conduct medal. Not a bad worker would, of course, be a Victoria Cross. Yesup's praise made the walk back to the collecting post seem shorter, as did the fact that Diggs was trailing along behind them like a whipped dog and took over one end of the stretcher whenever Yesup told him to in the knowledge that they wouldn't be going up again. At the collecting post, an ambulance had just left, so there was a bit of a wait for the next one. Yesup was soon deep in conference with one of the sergeants about Lamble's wound, so Thomas, feeling surplus to requirements, sloped off around the side of the hut for smoke. A few moments into it, Rawkins joined him. What happened there? He asked. Lamb got hit. Thomas said. Shrapnel shell. No, there. Rawkins said, gesturing with his chin in the direction of Diggs, who was standing near the hut door at something vaguely resembling attention. It wouldn't go out into no man's land to get him. Thomas explained. Fuck! Rawkins swore. Put it in eventually. Thomas shook his head. Yes, I gave him every chance. Told him we wouldn't make a thing of it if he got on with it. So, so now I guess he's got to make a thing of it. Fuck, Rockin said again. Lam was one of the ones that came over with you, wasn't he? Thomas nodded. We weren't might particularly. What was he doing out in no man's land without digs? That, Thomas said, is one of the questions Yesup said they wouldn't have to be asked if Diggs went out and got him. Oh, said Rawkins, nodding. But what I meant was, who did bring Lamb in? Thomas hesitated. Me and Yesup, he said quickly. How'd that go? Well, I managed not to pace myself, thanks. He decided he didn't have to mention the vomiting, since he'd managed not to get any of it on himself. That's always good, Rawkins noted. Was a bit wobbly when we got back in, he admitted. Just for a minute. Well, as long as it was after, Rawkins said. That's what Yesup said. When the next ambulance came, Lamble was loaded on first amid a chorus of solemn murmurings. 
The 47th hadn't lost a man since Thomas had arrived, and he learned from Rawkins they hadn't lost very many before that either. In fact, several of the vacancies their respective drafts had been sent to fill had, in fact, been the result of transfers, just as Bates had comfortingly suggested to Daisy before he'd left Downton. As a result, not even the more experienced men of the 47th were inured to the prospect of losing one of their own. People kept asking, How? And every time they did, Diggs looked even more sick with shame, which Thomas supposed was fair enough. Even the walking wounded, who presumably were more used to sudden and reasonless death, caught the general mood. An ambulance journey back to main dressing was never a jolly occasion, but this one was positively funeral. Do you know who his particular mates were? Yes, up asked at one point. Thomas shook his head. I think he pals around with the Methodists. He did in training, anyway. But he were a Quaker. Is, said one of the others, sharply and for a crazed second, Thomas thought he was correcting his grammar. He's a Quaker, Thomas agreed once he'd realized what the man meant. When they got back to the station, Thomas and Yesup took Lamble into surgical prep and began cutting his uniform off and they'd finished and were sluicing him down with a couple of buckets of water when one of the M.O.'s came in. He examined Lamble's wound and said, We'll take him next. Yesup and Thomas finished cleaning him up in the rough and ready way that you did here, and the two orderlies posted to the operating theater whisked him away. One of the prep room orderlies started picking up Lambo's clothes. What should I... He looked at the pile of bloody rags in the corner where they were throwing all the patient's things, and then at Yesup. You were supposed to keep the kit separated so that personal effects could be recovered later, but no one expected that nicety on a night like tonight. At least, no one in the RAMC did. Here... Yesup said, reaching for an instrument tray. Bung him in there, we'll sort it out later. After that, there was no more time to think about Lamble for a while because a wagon loan of walking wounded showed up and there was plenty of work to go around, helping them out of the wagon, sorting out which ones had better have a medical officer look at them right away, and then for the ones who could wait, finding them an empty spot to sit down and supplying them with tea and cigarettes. Once that was all finished and relative calm reigned once more, Yesup found him and said, Come on, lad, let's get us a cup of before the next lot gets here. Thomas let himself be herded to the orderly's room. When they got there, they found Diggs manning the kettle and slapping together jam sandwiches. He came up to them with several on a plate and held it out, hand shaking slightly. Thomas almost felt sorry for him. He knew what it was like to mess up so badly there was nothing you could do to fix it, but still have to embarrass yourself trying. But he stood there, blank-faced, waiting to see what Yusuf would do. Finally, the corporal reached out and grabbed a sandwich. Diggs' relief was palpable, though almost certainly misplaced, Thomas thought. But he was as hungry as the next bloke and took a sandwich, too. He sat down to eat it, which could have been a mistake, as he found himself far from certain he'd be able to get up again, bone-weary as he was. But when the next bus came in, and everyone, except Diggs, went out to meet it, Thomas found himself swept along by the tide. It was like drill, he thought. You switched off your mind and did what everybody else was doing. By dawn, they turned the tide. Wounded were coming in by ones and twos, and even that not very frequently, and a convoy arrived from the casualty clearing station to take the first lot of them away. With that, the day shift men were dismissed until it was time for the convoy to come back for another load of patients in about three hours' time. In the ordinary way of things, it would be nearly time for the day men to be coming on duty, but word had come from on high that the night shift, who had at least been fresh when the night's grueling labor had started, would stay on to handle the morning chores. Thomas contemplated the walk to the barn. It took at least a quarter hour to walk there when you weren't dead on your feet, and the same back. He'd curl up in a corner of the orderly's room, he decided. Unfortunately, he wasn't the first one to have had that idea. All of the corners were occupied and spaces along the walls. There was even somebody under the table. Thomas was eyeing a spot in front of the cooker. You'd be stepped on, sure, but might it be worth it? When he had a better idea. The linen room was empty, except for the linen. With a groan of satisfaction, he shrugged out of his tunic and webbing and collapsed gracelessly onto the floor. After taking a moment to wrench his boots off, he rolled under the folding and sorting table where he'd be partly hidden and mostly out of the way if anyone wanted linen. 
He was almost asleep when he heard the door open. Fuck, oh, wait. Moro, is that you? I will murder you, Thomas said. Budge up, said Rawkins, dropping his own gear. Thomas budged up. Rawkins crawled in next to him, and Thomas barely had time to register that he stank of blood and mud and hadn't bothered taking his boots off when sleep stuck up behind him and clobbered him on the head. Thomas woke, not quite three hours later, to the ward master's dulcet tones. Everybody up! Come on, you fuckers! Come, boys! Coming! He groaned and shoved Rawkins, who had at some point appropriated Thomas's left arm for use as a pillow. Sitting up, he shook the afflicted arm to restore circulation, noting as he did so that Rawkins was also the sort of bloke who drooled on his pillow. Well, his clothes had seemed worse the night before. It occurred to him belatedly that if he had gone back to the barn, he'd at least have been able to change into his less filthy set of clothes. But there was nothing for it now, and since it seemed quite a few of them had slept here, he wouldn't have been the only one still wearing yesterday's dirt. Still, he decided when he picked up his tunic and was treated to a scattering of dried and flaking mud, the first order of business was to have a wash. And at some point, he was going to have to sweep up in here and find a better place to put his webbing. After lacing on his boots, he nudged Rawkins with the toe of one and said, Putting it up, and left in search of water and soap. The more conventional washing places being occupied, he wound up at the pump in the service yard, the one the transport men used to water their horses. No one else was using it at the time, but it was clear that others had, and one of them had left a cake of soap and an extremely grubby towel for the benefit of the next user. They hadn't left a razor, unfortunately, but he was at least able to wash the worst of the grime off his face, hands, and arms. After drying off with the section of towel he judged least likely to undo his recent efforts, he turned his attention to his tunic. He was brushing it vigorously with what he strongly suspected was a horse brush. When Rawkins turned up, tunic unbuttoned and boots unlaced, carrying two cups of tea. Thank you, Bob, he said, handing Thomas one. Duh, Thomas said and drank half of it in one draft. What are you doing? Rawkins asked, squinting at him. Brushing my tunic. It was about as good as it was going to get, he decided, and put it on, saying, Here, I'll do yours while you wash. Rawkins shrugged out of his tunic and gave it to him. Wouldn't have thought of that. I used, Thomas said grimly, to want to be a valet. That dream seemed very far away now. Rawkins took his turn under the pump. Christ, that's cold! Wakes you up a bit. Thomas suggested, still brushing. Rawkins' tunic was less muddy than his own, but more bloody. While bloodstains were certainly not beyond the reach of Thomas's valetting skills, he was at a loss to do anything about them, using only a horse brush. So once Rawkins had emerged from under the pump and put his shirt back on, he held up the tunic for him to put on. Rawkins clearly had no idea how to go about being dressed, so it was a bit of a farce. But once it was on, Thomas said... There, now you can say you've been valetted by the same hands that have valetted dukes and earls. Only one of each, technically, but the plural sounded grander. That's something to write home about, Rollins said, doing up his buttons. Thomas swigged down the rest of his tea while getting his own shirt and tunic back on and asked, Was there any food where you got that? Bread and cheese, Rollins said. I didn't have a free hand to carry any. Convoy's not here yet. Thomas pointed out. They trooped inside and had just enough time to grab some food before the convoy was there. The rest of the day, Thomas was run off his feet. It was true that the night shift men had handled the essentials on the ward that morning, but only the essentials. After they loaded the convoy, he reported to officers medical. The ward master had not been kidding about assigning him to the officers when he went back on wards and found veritable mountains of things waiting to be washed in both the scullery and the sink room. He got the scullery, which was by far the less disagreeable of the two, the sink room being where bedpans were dealt with, but also meant that he had to keep an ear out for a shout of, Orderly! And then hurry back into the ward proper and say, Yes, sir. Once he managed to finish the washing up, interrupted three times,
times by requests for tea, twice for cigarettes, and once for an update on the wounded men from the officer's platoon. It was time to do dressing changes, and after that, the ward's medical officer came in to do his morning rounds, during which time the ward orderlies were meant to stand there and look alert on the off chance that the M.O. had a question or instruction for them. Rounds took longer than usual this morning because the ward was full. In fact, there were six extra patients on stretcher beds in the aisles, and because the new patients had been only hastily examined and treated so far. By the time the M.O. dismissed them, they were just in time to run down to the orderly's mess and grab the last crumbs left from lunch as it was being cleared away, and so on for the rest of the day. Alongside the work ran an equally breathless rush of gossip, which, along with tea and cigarettes, was what the station ran on, mostly concerning Lamble and Corporal Biggs. The two things Thomas was sure of were that Lamble had died a few hours after leaving surgery, which he knew because everyone's sources were agreed on this point, and that Diggs had spent the middle part of the day out back with a service battalion digging a grave, which Thomas knew because he had nipped out for a cigarette and seen him doing it. About everything else, rumors flew with abandon. Lamble would have made it if he'd been gotten into surgery just a bit earlier. Lamble was already a goner from the moment the shrapnel hit him. Diggs had ordered him out into no man's land. Lamble had volunteered to go when Diggs refused. Diggs was in the guard room, weeping unconsolably and begging forgiveness from God and anyone who would listen. Diggs had buggered off to an estaminet and didn't give a crap. Diggs was now considered unreliable and was being sent rearward, the lucky bastard. Diggs was due to be shot tomorrow at dawn, the poor bastard. If Diggs wasn't shot tomorrow at dawn, a dozen or so of Lamble's self-appointed mates were going to be the living hell out of him. Hearing this last, Thomas said, Do these mates of his know he was a Quaker? Only I'm not sure it's what he would want. I'm just saying. By tea time, word had gotten round that Thomas had been there when it happened, and from then on, he couldn't show his face outside the ward without being asked to confirm or deny this or that rumor. Most of the time, all he said was, I don't know, I wasn't there for that part, which was usually true. Before dinner, they were told to form up in the ambulance yard, which did double duty as a parade ground. As they were doing so, a fellow named Morris asked, is it true that Yesup borrowed an officer's sidearm and said he'd shoot Diggs himself if he didn't go out and get Lamble? I don't know. Thomas began automatically before realizing that he was there for that part. No, he did not do that. Oh, Morris looked disappointed. It didn't remind him we were in the face of the enemy and that he'd have to make a report, Thomas added. That sounds more like Yesup, said someone else. But then jump! shouted the wardmaster, and everyone shut up and snapped too. The chief medical officer, a Major Thwaite, strode out. He was about fifty, a small man in glasses. He never spoke to Thomas or to anyone he knew, but all the medical officers snapped to attention when he entered a ward and spoke of him with the same awe that the orderlies did, the wardmaster. Stand up, sir, the wardmaster said, and they all moved into parade rest. Thomas was acutely conscious of his filthy and unshaven state, and was only glad he was in the middle of the group. After a few remarks about the previous night being a difficult one and good work under trying conditions, Thwaite said, It is my sad duty to make known to you that we have lost one of our own. Private Christopher Lamble has died of wounds received in the performance of his duties. Even though there can't have been anyone at the station who didn't already know it, there was an audible gasp at the announcement, followed by murmurs. Dun-dun! The wardmaster shouted again, and they all shut up and came to attention again. Swate continued, A brief service will be held at the graveside on Sunday, that is to say tomorrow, immediately following the regular chapel service. Any man who does not ordinarily attend the Methodist service, but wishes to be excused from duty for this purpose, should speak to his section corporal. He nodded to the worn master, who shouted, Dismissed! And they all headed in to dinner. While Thomas was making his way there, Rollins caught up with him. What do you suppose they do at a Quaker funeral? He wondered. Don't know, said Thomas. I suppose they speak if the spirit of God moves them. Rollins, who had been there that day, huffed. Dinner was the usual stew made of bully beef, but there was plenty of it along with decent local bread and butter. Thomas ate heartily, and that, 
along with the chance to sit down for more than a minute at a stretch, allowed the weariness of the day to sneak up on him. That was a shame, because he had at least another hour and a half of work ahead of him, getting the patients on his ward settled in for the night, and that was if the evening's intake of new patients was light. Even when things were quiet at their bit of front, they got a batch of casualties around this time of day, it being safer to move them to the rear under cover of darkness. For about a week, they'd been getting more than usual, ambulance loads growing into convoys and keeping everyone at their posts for an extra hour, then two, then three, culminating in the nightmare of last night. Now, Thomas felt like crying at the thought of even a couple of hours extra work, and if they had another night like the last one, or somehow even worse, he wasn't sure how he'd live through it. Everyone else clearly felt the same way. When one of the corporals called for order and announced, Ambulances en route from the collecting post, there was a chorus of groans and muttering. The groans turned into a ragged cheer when the corporal continued, with farm bliss and patience on him. Oh, thank God. Things were getting back to normal. The thought of getting a full night's sleep was enough to get him back on his feet and on his way back to officer surgical. He was handing out medications and about halfway down his side of the ward when Jessup came in. Pedro, what master wants to see you? Great. Not only was that going to put him behind in his work, but what the heck did the bloody ward master want with him? He couldn't think of anything he'd done unless it was looking disgraceful at Bahrain, and plenty of the others had looked worse. I'll take over from here, Yesup said kindly. That was one load off his mind. Thanks, he hesitated. Did he say why? He asked, wondering if he ought to take a moment to try and make himself slightly more presentable. That business last night. Yesup said with a glance at Hawkins, who was trying to look like he wasn't eavesdropping. Oh, that. Yesup had said he'd be making a report. He hurried along to the wardmaster's room, wondering whether there was some way to find out if Joseph had happened to mention that Thomas had had a tiny bit of trouble after they brought Lamble in. He probably didn't. It braced up in front of the wardmaster's desk, but only for a moment before the wardmaster was waving him into a chair, saying, We're not all fucking bright. Leaning back in his own chair and puffing on a pipe, he said, I need you to take me through the shit show with fucking digs last night. What he said it did, what Corporal Yosep said it did. Understand? Yes, sir. Sergeant, I don't worry about dropping him in the fucking shit, because he's already in it. Right now, we're just talking, but if he fights this thing, you're going to have to say it again on the oath, and we don't want any fucking discrepancies. Yes, Sergeant, Thomas repeated. The ward master made a get on with it sort of gesture, and Thomas said, Uh, where do you want me to start? Where, when we got to where Diggs was? When you first became aware there was something fucking unusual going on, the war master answered. The whole night had been unusual, as far as Thomas was concerned, but he supposed he knew what the ward master meant. Well, Corporal Jessup and I were at the outpost when Dolish came running up looking for a sergeant. He said that Lamb, Private Lamble, was in no man's land and he'd been hit and Diggs wouldn't go after him. All right, said the war master, nodding. So we went up to the front line trench. Corporal Jessup, Dolish and me, that is. Dolish showed us where Diggs was in a dugout with some wounded. He was just sitting there, I mean. He wasn't looking after them or anything, as far as I could see. Jessup asked him where Amber was, and he pointed out towards the parapet. Dolish got a periscope somewhere, and they went and looked. They? Dolish and Corporal Jessup. I went with them. Thomas remembered the sick feeling of not wanting to be near Diggs any longer than he had to. Where was Diggs? He stayed in the dugout. The ward master made a note. All right. Thomas went on. After Dolish showed Corporal Jessup where Lamble was, he left to get on with carrying back wounded. Jessup and I went back in the dugout, and Jessup said he was going out to get Lamble. Diggs said he wouldn't go. Do you remember whether or not Diggs said anything that might indicate whether or not he knew that Lamble was still alive? Thomas started to shake his head, then stopped. Well, I asked Corporal Jessup if he was, and Jessup said he thought so. 
I don't remember Diggs saying anything about it, but he was right there. Do you remember what words Joseph used when he spoke to Diggs at that point? Not exactly. It was... chaotic. It was something about going out to get the lad Diggs was supposed to be looking after. Did he tell Diggs to go with him? Thomas remembered Diggs saying, You're a corporal, same as me, and understood why the wardmaster was asking. Not in so many words. Diggs reminded Jessup that they were of the same rank, and Jessup tried to, you know, to be him alone. Said something about how anybody could have a funny turn into a situation like that, but he had to move past it. Diggs said again that he weren't going. Did Jessup say anything else to try to persuade him that you remember? Thomas nodded. He reminded him that we were in the face of the enemy. Do you happen to remember if he used those exact words? In the face of the enemy. Yes, Sergeant. Are you absolutely fucking sure? Yes, Sergeant, Thomas repeated. I remembered the phrase from training and I recognized it when he said it. And how did Diggs fucking respond? Thomas thought for a moment, then shook his head. I'm not sure. I know we didn't go, obviously, but... The wardmaster's eyes bored into him. I wasn't exactly keen on going either, Sergeant. All that really registered was that he wasn't going to change his mind. Do you remember what Corporal Jessup said to you? He showed me Lambeau's position through the trench periscope and gave me some advice about staying low. Pointed out a shell hole where we could take cover if there was any trouble. Anything else? Thomas thought. I think he said something encouraging. I couldn't say what. Did he, at any point, directly order you to leave the fucking trench and assist him in retrieving Private Lambeau? Thomas's guts went cold. He hadn't. Had he? Was he supposed to have had? Was Thomas supposed to have waited for him to have done? Not that I recall, Sergeant. The wardmaster stared at him again. Um, uh, like I said, I wasn't keen. I just wanted to get it over with. Perhaps he ought to have said that he didn't want to leave Lamble lying out there any longer than necessary, but that hadn't been on his mind at all. So I'm not sure what he said or what I said or anything. All right, said the wardmaster. Just out of fucking curiosity, were you still in front of Diggs when you and Jessup talked about going out after Lamp? I think so, Thomas said. Part of it. I mean, we started talking about it, and then we went out to the fire step to look through the periscope. The wardmaster shook his head. That fucking tosser. All right, that's everything I need about the night in question. Thomas was glad he was napping there. That meant he wouldn't have to decide what to say about his own funny tone. Anticipating that he was about to be dismissed, he asked, Sergeant? Yeah? What is going to happen to Corporal Diggs? Is it going to be a fucking corporal for much longer? You can bet on that, the wardmaster said. He studied Thomas for a moment, then stood up. Thomas, of course, popped to his feet instantly. The wardmaster sighed, shook his head, and bent down to open a file drawer. Taking out a bottle, he gestured with it toward the other half of the room and said, Come on, lad. Thomas went, and at the wardmaster's invitation, sat gingerly on one of the armchairs in front of his fireplace. The wardmaster fumbled around on the low table that sat between the chairs until he found some glasses. After pouring a stiff measure into one of them, he paused and said, You want Methodist, are you? No. Thomas said, biting off the sergeant, as it was fairly clear by now that he was not getting a bullocking. The wardmaster poured a second drink and handed it to Thomas. Armagnac, he said. French, but it's not bad. It was damn good, Armagnac, too. After drinking down half of his, the wardmaster said, It's shite. Publishing a man for being scared of dying. We all know it's shite, but the thing is, you can't run a war if every bugger gets to decide for himself whether he's willing to die or not. You get that right? I mean, why'd you go, seeing as you weren't fucking keen on it? Thomas pondered the wisdom of admitting that he had not considered that he had a choice. He was fairly sure that the wardmaster did not mean to suggest that he actually had, so there wasn't much point in saying that. Somebody had to do it. And there wasn't anybody else there. If there had been, Thomas would have waited to see if somebody else would volunteer. There you fucking go, said the wardmaster. It's all right not to want to. It's all right to hope some other bugger gets the fucking job. 
But if you're the bugger what gets it, you have to fucking do it. Otherwise, you're letting down your mates. That's why those fuckers in the PBE go over the fucking top when they're told. PBI, Thomas knew, was poor bloody infantry. Nobody wants to. You go, because you're more scared of letting down your mates than you are of getting shot at. He poured himself another drink, lifting the bottle in Thomas's direction. Thomas still had half of his first one left and shook his head. The thing about things is that he's too fucking used to letting down his mates. He's always been like that, and you can live with it in garrison. There are plenty of fucking workshop corporals in the police time armor, but in war, in the face of the fucking enemy, that shit gets good men killed. He knocked back his drink and continued. I should have nipped it in the fucking bud the day we got here. I could have done it last month when he pulled that fucking stunt, leaving you with a linen delivery when you'd been here ten fucking minutes. If I'd hold him up on charges right then, we might not be in this fucking mess. He shook his head. You saved that filthy fucker's life, you know. How? Sergeant? I could shoot him for what he did. It doesn't matter that Yesop had no right to order him. It was his plain duty in the face of the fucking enemy. And he refused to do it. Three times at least the fucking Judas. But if you'd taken a look at that bloke old enough to be your fucking dad, refusing to do his fucking job and said, If we ain't doing it, fuck if I am. Well then, he'd have been so in fear in the ranks. Joseph wasn't going to make you do it. If you hadn't stopped up, He'd have gone looking for somebody else, and before he did, every bugger in that fucking trench would have had time to think, if that son of a bitch gets to say no, why can't I? They'd have had to shoot him to get that thought out of every bugger else's head. Oh, I see, said Thomas. The war master poured again, and this time Thomas accepted the offer of a refill. This isn't to spread around. We want him and everybody else to fucking stew in the possibilities for a couple of days. But they'll offer him summary punishment. Busted back to private in a month or so of FP fucking one. Feel the punishment one was the thing O'Brien had been talking about where they tied you to a post. It wasn't supposed to be done in range of enemy fire, but everyone knew of a bloke who knew of a bloke who had seen it done that way. You did a couple of hours of that every day, and the rest of your time you spent on fatigues. The worst ones anybody can think of. Digging graves, for example. That seems fair enough. Thomas said. It's a fucking gift, the war master said. It's what I should have done a month ago, but I thought making him switch jobs with a fucking new bloke might knock some sense into him. He picked up the bottle, considered it for a moment, and put the cap back on. Does not to spread around either. Can't have everyone knowing the fucking war master fucked up. I shouldn't be fucking telling you, except I know you can keep your fucking mouth shut. If you couldn't, every bugger in the shithole would be talking about how one of the fucking new blogs had to go out and get lamb while Diggs was fucking wetting himself. I did tell Rawlins, Thomas admitted. He's one of my bullet mates. You can tell any bugger you want to. That part's not a fucking secret. He picked up the bottle, opened it again, and poured another drink. At any rate, you're Lance Corporal cleaning up Diggs's fucking mess again. Congratulations. He raised his glass. Thomas wasn't sure if he was referring to his inadvertently saving Diggs' life, or if he was literally being made Lance Corporal again. It seemed an important distinction, so he asked, Sergeant? You're taking over his fucking duties again, the war master clarified. Oh, is it the linen again? That wouldn't be so bad. It wasn't interesting work, but after the week he'd had, he wouldn't mind a dull job. But the ward master shook his head. There's night, Corporal, in day block. You'll be fine. Those are the easiest fucking words for night duty. That's why he had them. And Jessup's on C block, so he'll be right there if you need a hand. It wasn't the work Thomas was worried about, although he might get around to that later. He was stuck on the fact that it was a night shift. He didn't mind night shifts, except that he'd been up for all but three of the last 36 hours. And he didn't have the first idea how he'd get through twelve more. He felt sort of like crying. Yes, sergeant, he said, trying to keep his voice level. You've worked at all those wards before, the war master reminded him. Thomas nodded. D block was officers sick, officers convalescent, men's sick, and men's convalescent, all of which would be operating as normal. The medical and surgical wards, the ones that dealt with wounds, were the ones that would be particularly challenging due to the recent activity at the front. 
On the U, you've got Woods, Taylor, and Bonner. They're all decent study blokes. They were also all more experienced than he was. The easy way you could tell was that none of them lived in the fucking barn. Thomas considered whether there was any way to ask exactly how much they were going to resent him being leapfrogged up over their heads. Uh, the M.O. on call is Alan B. He's young enough and kin enough he won't get too fucking out of sorts if you wake him up for an emergency that fucking isn't. Yes, Sergeant, Thomas agreed. It would be all right once he got through tonight. Report a couple of hours early tomorrow. The day bloke will show you the fucking ropes. Yes, sir. I don't have to do it tonight. The ward master stared at him. I'm not a fucking sadist. Diggs has been sitting on his fucking arse in the guard room all day. You can do it tonight. Christ, no. Finish up your fucking ward and report back tomorrow around tea time. Yes, Sergeant said Thomas gratefully, even counting in that he'd inevitably be woken up when everybody else got up, he'd get at least ten hours sleep. It was going to be glorious. When he got back to the ward, Jessup who had nearly finished getting the patient settled in. After they finished the last round of bedpans, Thomas eyed him, wondering if he'd known that Thomas was being made a lance corporal again. If he did, he gave no sign of it. Once the work was done, Thomas started for the billet, this time taking the direct route. He needed sleep more than he needed solitude. He hoped that everyone else would feel the same way, but when he got there, everyone was sitting up and talking quietly. It was definitely more subdued than most evenings, but it didn't look like they were planning to go to bed. Or bedroll. Early. He picked his way to his spot, acknowledging nods and muttered greetings as he went. Rollins, he noticed, had spread out his bedroll a little further than usual from the bloke on the other side. Thomas did the same, so there wasn't an obvious gap where Lamble's place had been. He'd lit a cigarette and was taking off his boots when Rollins said, How are you holding up? I'm so tired, I could die, Thomas said. But I just got switched to nights, starting tomorrow. I meant about Lamble, Rollins explained. Thomas shrugged. That's a fucking shame. Rollins and the others nearby nodded and said things like, Too right. They all looked expectantly at him for a moment. Thomas wondered what they were expecting him to do. Tell the story about bringing him in from no man's land, possibly. But he was too tired for it. I was just talking to him, said Caldwell, another of the ones from their training group. Just before, when we were picking up the room ration, I asked him if I could have his since he was teetotal. Someone else said something about the last time they'd spoken to Lamble, and then someone else after that. Abruptly, Thomas realized why. They weren't used to this, even though they'd all seen deaths. Scores of them. Those had been strangers. Men who came into their lives as mangled pieces of meat. They didn't know, down to the bone, what it was like to have somebody just wink out of existence like that. They didn't know that the worst thing you could do was talk about it. Abruptly, he shoved his feet back into his boots and went outside. He was sitting on one of the larger pieces of the rubble that used to be the farmhouse, smoking and carefully not thinking about anything at all, when someone approached. Rollins. He sat down next to Thomas and lit his pipe. What do you want? Thomas asked. Rollins clapped him on the shoulder. You will right. Yeah, he said. It wasn't like he and Lamble had been mates or anything. He didn't have mates here. He decided not to. And if he had, it wouldn't have been Lamble. Look, I'm as sorry as anybody else that he's dead. But there's no point. He gestured vaguely with his cigarette. Wallowing in it makes it worse. He's not the first and he's sure as hell not going to be the last. That's comforting, said Rollins dryly. I mean, that's what they're all thinking, right? Am I next? It's not about Lamble, not really. You were probably his best mate in the billet. Thomas gave him a skeptical look. He liked that you didn't bleed at him, Rollins explained. All oh, right, he'd been the one they bleeded at back in training camp. On account of his name, Thomas opposed. That never really started up here, did it? No, said Rollins, giving him a funny look. He thought you stopped them doing it. The other ones from your draft. Why would he have done that? It wasn't funny, 
Thomas said. I mean, so what if he's got a stupid name? Plank's name is worse because he's thick as two short ones, but nobody gives him grief about it. Rollin shrugged. They like Plank. God knew why. But I didn't have anything to do with them stopping. I don't know, said Rollins. Maybe you never told them to knock it off. But if you weren't doing it, it couldn't really be the thing to do, could it? Thomas had no idea why whether he bleeded or not would make a difference in whether anyone else did, but he just shrugged and smoked. Anyway, I just wish they'd shut up so I can go to sleep. By the time he went in, not too long after Rollins, the others had started settling in, finally. As he fell asleep, he was wondering if anyone had thought yet of nicking Lambo's blanket. It wouldn't do a lot to make the barn floor more comfortable, but it might help a bit. 1st October, 1915 Dear Cousin Robert, I'm sorry that Mary was upset by getting a field postcard. The truth is, we've been having a fairly rotten time of it here, and for a while there was simply no time to write. We're back in billets now, finally, but I have quite a number of letters to write to men's families. It seems to use many of the same muscles, as it were, as it does to write a proper letter to her, or to mother for that matter. After I've done a batch of them, I've simply nothing left. And I do feel that the families who are never going to see their sons or brothers or husbands again have a stronger claim on my attention just now. I can't think of the right way to put that to her so that it doesn't sound as though I'm saying she's selfish for worrying about me. Of course she isn't. But I can send a field postcard to let everyone know that I'm all right, because I am all right, and the dead men can't. Perhaps having written such letters yourself, you can help her to understand. I suppose that's why I am writing to you now instead of to Mary as I should, because you have seen war. It's much easier to write to my friends who are at some point up or down the line doing much the same things I'm doing than it is to write to anyone at home. One doesn't have to try to convey what it's like, or to put things in a reassuring way. So I will write to you, as I would a brother officer, and say that we are some distance from the big show, and glad of it. But for about a week, we have been conducting a side show of our own, in order to oblige the enemy to keep at his posts across the way. It was all the harder because things had been so quiet here before. It came as rather a shock to the neighbors when we started making noise, but once they had grasped the new order of things, they lost no time in making a racket of their own. Things were beginning to quiet down again when we were sent back to billets, so with any luck, we will have an easier time of it when we rotate back up. I ran into Thomas, by the way, Private Barrow, as he is now. He happened to be at the aid post as part of a stretcher party, at the same time I was checking on my wounded. It was on the worst night we've had, so I didn't have time to really speak to him, nor he to me but he looked as well as could be expected. Since you asked me to keep an eye out, I asked after him when I went to the dressing station the next day. An extraordinary foul-mouthed master sergeant told me that the previous night had been Barrow's first time under heavy fire, and that he'd done rather well. I should say that I was at the dressing station to visit my men. I am quite well. Sincerely, Matthew Crawley. Have you heard from Thomas lately? Robert asked as Bates was getting his dinner clothes ready. A field postcard today, my lord, said Bates. We were glad to get it, as the last we'd heard from him was that things were very busy. Matthew ran into him, Robert said, retrieving the letter from his waistcoat pocket. He says there's some distance from Luz, but there was fighting in their sector. At least he was fairly sure that was what Matthew had been saying. The phrases he'd used had been almost as foreign as the notion of a subaltern openly saying that he was glad to be on the sidelines of a major battle instead of in the thick of it. Robert wondered if it was true that he'd say such a thing to a brother officer. Certainly no one would have done so in his war, even if they'd been thinking it. Taking the letter from the envelope, he folded it so that the paragraph about Thomas showed. Here. Bates read it, nodding as he did so. Well, that's good to hear, he said, handing it back. In his letters, he sounds as though he's doing well enough, but you can never tell. I admit I didn't think it wise him joining up just what he did. Robert unbuttoned his waistcoat and let Bates take it off of him. 
I do wonder what Matthew's standards are for foul mouthedness in a master sergeant. They'd had a fine example of the breed in their regiment in South Africa. If it's the one Thomas calls the wardmaster, my lord, I get the impression he could give old Sergeant Gibbs a run for his money. For Thomas's sake, let's hope he takes after Gibbs in other ways too, Robert noted. Gibbs had been a solid enough chap, and a sergeant like that could make your war.